Look, we all agree that priority one from 2017 has been to fight and win against Galamsey. The president said so. In this speech that has been re-quoted and referenced until there's nothing left. But, you know, often we play the part where he says he's willing to put his presidency on the line. What you may not realize is that in that speech, he said a lot more. Here's a little bit more of it. The cabinet, when we decided the time had come for us to put the weight of government behind the decision to try and stop illegal mining in Galamse, we composed the cabinet of very responsible Ghanaians, headed by a very renowned, eminent figure in our country, Professor Kwame Frimpong Mbwati. And they are the ones who then designed a program for us of what we needed to do to try and arrest the menace and preserve our heritage. In the course of it, Professor Frimpong Mbwati goes on a, a, to a meeting, a conference in Abidjan, and there the Ivorian leaders tell him, you people are not helping us. This illegal mining that is taking place in Ghana is beginning to affect us, our water bodies and our space in Côte d'Ivoire. Rivers, waters, even forests, they don't know national boundaries. They run across nations. And there he was, very embarrassed, very apologetic that the activities of Ghanaians is jeopardizing the space of another a fellow a neighbor country in our region. That's how serious the matter is. Rivers that have been with us for centuries are drying up. Forest areas, which we should preserve for the sanctity of our life and our environment, being devastated by this phenomenon of Galamse. And all kinds of people from all aspects of our national life are involved in this exercise. Security personnel, political leaders, businessmen, and they say it. Nananum, some are all involved in this. So we sat down, we said to ourselves, we have a responsibility. When you take the oath that you are, you are sworn to protect the integrity of the nation, Ghana, you sworn to uphold its constitution, you swear to uphold its sovereignty. That is that the care of the nation, what's in it, its people, its resources, its nature have been put in your care temporarily as a trustee like Nananum are trustees of the lands on which they occupy for their people. So you are too at the national level a trustee of the lands and the resources of our nation. So you ask yourself, how best can you discharge this trust? You sit back and say, well, all these young men don't have anything to do. So let it go on. At least it's better that they're earning something, that they should be at home and perhaps causing other kinds of problems. When you know that the activities that, are, that they're involved in are jeopardizing the very survival of the, our nation. I took the decision that that would be a betrayal of the trust that the Ghanaian people put on me, in me on the 7th of January this year. And as a result, we established this committee within the government to design a policy for us, not just to stop it, to reclaim the land, to let our rivers work again, but also to see how we can figure a way for all these able-bodied young men who are involved in this activity to find an alternative livelihood. So it's a package. It's a package that we have designed to try and bring this menace to a conclusion. I've said it in the cabinet, and perhaps it's the first time I'll be saying it in public. I am prepared to put my presidency on the line on this matter. I've heard it being said that uh, oh, I should be careful. These, some, many of these people voted for me, and if I continue this exercise, perhaps they'll not vote for me again. If, if by the grace of God, I'm in, I'm, I, I'm in a position, my party allows me to go again, and I have the health and everything to go again, that I'll not get it again. And I'll say to myself, well, this is a choice that all of us have to make as human beings. You do what you think is right, or do you do what you think will allow you to get along. I think that you do what you think is right. That is what you're required to do. Fortunately for me, in this fight, I have great allies 
first of all, within my government. The people who are in the front line of that, some of, all of them are here. The Minister for Environment, Science, Technology and Innovation. The Minister for Lands and Natural Resources. The Minister for Water Resources and Sanitation. Eminent Ghanaian, responsible Ghanaian, who have gone out of their way to lead this crusade. But from the beginning, they said something, which is the reason why you're here today. We cannot win this fight without the support of the traditional authorities of our country. Hmm. President had a lot to say there. It's not just his presidency that he put on the line, but he called the whole nation to action. He, he listed what is now common knowledge, that people from all walks of life are involved in Galamsey. He talked about political leaders. He talked about chiefs. He, 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 he made the point that Professor Frimpong Boating made in his report in 2021. That all kinds of people were mining illegally. The president knew this as far back as 2017 when he called us all to action in this fight against Galamsey. But now, if Professor Frimpong Boating's report is to be believed, the whole thing was a red herring. And that the things that needed to be done in order for this fight to succeed never got done. And today, now that Professor Frimpong Boating's report has come out, all we've got so far are denials. Denials, denials, denials. From the presidency, from others who have been mentioned in the report. So was it all a sham? I'm very glad that our guest is here to help us navigate at least one aspect of the answer to that question. Let's say good morning to ex-captain Jamal Tunzwa Seydu. It's good to have you. Thank you, Kojo. And good morning to your audience. Indeed. Uh, Ex-Captain um, Jamal is a lawyer. Uh, he used to be a military lawyer. He was brought in to advise the government on the legal basis for Operation Vanguard. Um, my understanding is you were brought in a year after Operation Vanguard started. Precisely. Okay. So as far as you're aware, for a year... There was no clarity on the legal component for Operation Vanguard Obviously. until you and others were brought in. Right. Interesting. Let's start from there. What were you told when you were brought in? What was asked of you? Well, um, could you um, let me say that the, the um, soundbite or whatever recording that you played was uh, that speech was delivered at a time that I was in the military academy. Mm. So the exciting part of it is that I came into the theater with a very open mind. Professionally, uh, I have to approach tasks with an open mind. So I had no biases whatsoever, no mm. confirmation bias. I had um, no negativity bias. I just was told one morning just when I was about to end my regimental officer training at the third battalion of infantry in Sunyani, that mm. the army headquarters has inserted you at Wawasi in Obuasi. And that was really, really unsettling because um, at the time, within military circles, it was very um, disturbing to be told that you're going to work with Operation Vanguard because there were so many frustrations. and. My curiosity was why and who would have thought that I would be the best person to set up a legal office when there was none uh, prior to the moment that I, I just talked to you about. Mm. And so I'm like, who is trying to make me uncomfortable? Because uh, I've just finished orienting myself in military circles. So why are they inserting me there? In any case, um, I'm still a junior at the bar. So... Uh, is it that someone wants to embarrass me or um, mm. is it that I'm not going to be a to serious fail. person? Yeah, w w was I set, set up, up to fail? fail. Mm. And so those were the things going on on my mind. But um, I reported back at the general headquarters um, and um, spoke to a few seniors, asked them, what is the law on Operation Vanguard? And there was so much confusion. No one 
knew what the law on Operation Vanguard was. Question, what is our mandate in all of this? No one had an answer for me. You didn't know your mandate? At best, I was given an opportunity to see the operational order. But um, uh, there was really... And, and, and in that operational order, didn't you see your mandate in there? Uh, well, um, the Commander-in-Chief has taxed the Ghana Armed Forces uh, together with um, the Ghana Police Service in a joint operation, um, which was codenamed Operation Vanguard, to combat illegal mining. And, and that was it. So, mm. yeah, so from the strategic level, um, that was it at the operational level. And so mm. I had to be um, at the tactical level, you know, um, as a, um, we, we, we call that um, a staff officer mm. to the, the commanders at the HQ. So help us understand at this point where the only thing that exists is an operational order. What is missing? So, so yeah, what are the the necessary components that are missing? When you say there is no law, so what does it mean that the the the, the Operation Vanguard does not know what their jurisdiction is, who they can arrest, what to do when they arrest them? Is that what you mean when you say there's no law? Well, I I think the way you have framed it is how I thought about it at the time, um, because uh, given that it's a matter of such um, serious importance, you would want to have um, a sense of clarity on who does what and how and when. And so um, if the military and police were inserted in the theater, that's um, in, in, in the areas where you had um, illegal mining operations going on, what was the mandate of the, the military? What was the mandate of the police? So what I did was that I'm going to be a staff officer, I'm going to advise on the law. Mm. And so I immediately went to the assembly press and brought um, all our mining laws at the time mm. um, up to that date. And so seized with that, I um, reported at the headquarters in Obuasi. Mm. And um, you know, there was no office there was no legal office attached to the, the, the operation, and so I had to set up one um, and just figure it out myself. And this was and after the operation had been going on for one year? Yes, indeed. Okay. But at the time it started, I was still undergoing training at the military mm -hmm. academy. So what I did was I reviewed the laws, and then um, I called for crime officers with the, from the police element of um, the joint task force. And then I asked them, what, uh, how do you go about this work? Um, what are the failures? How can we um, correct them? And how can we make this whole exercise a meaningful one? So they converged at um, the headquarters from three forward operating bases. Um, there was we call them FOBs in our terms. There was FOB West in Takwa, FOB Central, uh, somewhere around Chichire, and then um, FOB East in um, you know the Koforidia area, mm -hmm. and then FOB Ashanti, which was in um, Obuasi. Mm -hmm. So and that's that also doubled as the headquarters. Right. So what he told me was that look, based on the mining laws, they had. Um, apprehended some suspected illegal miners okay. and um, the numbers of these miners were close to were over thousand in excess of um, thousand if not even about three thousand and um, they had also impounded some mining equipment notably excavators um, you know shangfang machines mm. and um, you know water pumps um, and even weapons and explosives mm. So I found that to be fascinating. And um, I'm like, so how many convictions have you secured so far? And the number was appalling. So out of thousands of arrests, out of um, the several mining equipment that were um, impounded, which in, in legal terms, you, you would want to think of that as um, exhibits or possible exhibits mm. during prosecution, um, we did 
nothing meaningful in terms of or the operation that i have just entered at that mm -hmm. time had done nothing meaningful in terms of convictions do you have a memory of about how many convictions at the time out of the over thousand uh, arrests i can tell you that um 100 would be just um, an overstatement wow yeah. so less than 10 percent mm -hmm. of the arrest had led to uh, prosecutions and convictions right and at the time i remember there was just one judge um so these offenses were usually um you know prosecuted at the circuit court mainly in Obuasi and at um, um Ashanti Bekwai and there was just one judge who hmm. was sitting in both um both courts hmm. and so there was a backlog um you know you had interferences with um you know the the, the evidence and um you know so many limitations hmm. Uh, Let me ask you this. So, we observed throughout the lifetime of Operation Vanguard that there were different approaches to the strategy of prosecution. The arrests and seizures kept going on, but there were different approaches. At some point, they were seizing excavators and equipment at some point they started burning them uh, was any of this based on your advice the burning of excavators what, what was the legal backing for that were you aware of this how did we come to that point of burning what should be evidence and exhibits like you said well probably that was why i was inserted that's why the legal office was set up mm -hmm. and um, that's also indicative of um you know the fact that probably the exercise itself of the operation was not thought through um if you recall I, uh, this this joint task force was set up in 2017 at the mm -hmm. time i was in the military academy mm -hmm. i was inserted in 2018 a year after it was set up now when i got out of the academy i remember reading reports about um, the burning of excavators and that was really shocking because it is it, it flies in the face of our property laws even you know constitutionally protected rights um you know i mean if you suspect someone is committing a crime the the way to go about it is not to really deprive them of their constitutionally protected uh, property rights right so that in itself didn't make sense to me mm -hmm. in any case um we operate a political system a constitutional order that is based on the rule of law that there should be predetermined rules pre-established rules that would govern matters ahead of um you know time mm. and so in my estimation um whatever would be done by state authorities should be um you know sanctioned by by the law mm. and so if someone is engaged in illegal mining what do the laws on illegal mining prescribe as the punishments for that mm. um, so uh, when I entered and I thought that we needed to remedy this um, unconstitutionality what I you know advised was that look we cannot go beyond the sanction regime prescribed by the mining laws mm. and um, I thought at the time and I still believe in that I thought if, if we hadn't even tinkered with our laws from that point even until now the laws would have been adequate to take care of the matter mm. Um, what I mean by this is, so you have a law at the time which said that, look, when um, an illegal mining operation is going on, any property or equipment associated with the illegal mining, irrespective of ownership, would be impounded. Mm. And when a conviction is secured, um, what you would have is that the property would be confiscated to the mm. state. And I found that to be exciting. Mm. And so it doesn't matter even if um, whosoever is arrested is just um, an agent of some, you know, person that we cannot see. Mm. It doesn't matter that um, the equipment there do not belong to who has been arrested. Mm. But insofar as, you know, there is suspicion that illegal mining is ongoing the equipment should be impounded mm -hmm. and if 
the persons who were apprehended or any one of them is, is um, convicted, then the property would be confiscated to the state. Mm. And I found that to be very um, exciting. In any case, what you had in reality was the predominance of foreign nationals in the business, mm -hmm. Mm. in the enterprise. And by definition, that was illegal mining. Yeah. In any case, what you had was um, dredging in riverbeds, and by definition, illegal. it was illegal mining. Mm. In any case, what you had was mining in forest reserves, mm. and that by definition was illegal mining. And in any case, there was a fiat on mining activities in yes. some of these Small areas. Scale. So yeah. there was even no question, or there shouldn't have been any question about do you have a license? So it looked like, uh, so licenses were suspended. You know, so there, there was even no question of whether you had a license or not. So that should have really been a very easy and simple exercise, very straightforward exercise. Mm. In fact, um, why I think that the operation wasn't thought through is that I, 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 given how important this thing is to our governance at that high level of government, I, I don't understand how you can mount such an operation without at least thinking about the cost effectiveness component of it. Because look, you are th going to be looking at, um, <laughs> so procurements were made, mm. you know, for vehicles, land cruisers, troopers for the police and the military elements. I mean, the taxpayer paid for that. Mm. Uh, fuel will be banned to run these vehicles. The taxpayer paid for that. Um, uniforms will be procured, ration, um, the health needs of um, the troops. Mm. And allowances were given to troops on the f um, in the field f uh, per, per day. So Why is that not tax if, uh, I mean cost effective? Because that we're looking at protecting our water bodies and our environment. We Th cannot put money to that, can we? Thank you. Cost effectiveness is simply this, that we had secured some, uh, we had apprehended a substantial number of, um, you know, suspected illegal miners. Mm. We had a lot of exhibits that should have been a good basis for prosecutions and the law was deterrent enough mm -hmm. and if we had followed through with those prosecutions we didn't need any more apprehensions mm -hmm. we didn't need to apprehend any more illegal miners mm -hmm. and that itself would have get, would minute. have solved the problem are you suggesting that based on the kind of arrests that you saw if we had prosecuted those persons it would have been enough to deter others from getting through and it would have been enough to stop us from going back to combat illegal mining with, a, with Operation Vanguard. Precisely. Look, think about it. How much does an excavator cost? And a of lot. the thousands or hundreds of excavators, mm. if we had just convicted any of the suspects, a, any of the equipment related to that case, once it's conviction was property. done, confiscation. And if these excavators never got back to their owners, uh, just think of it. Human beings are rational actors. Uh, we, we act based on incentives and disincentives. Now, if you lose three excavators or ten excavators um, <laughs> because even your agent was, was uh, convicted, mm. you know, I, I don't see why that would not be a good disincentive for you to engage in illegal mining. And if, even he if he just joined us, like we're talking to ex-captain Jamal Tunzwasidu. He's a lawyer. Uh, he was brought in to advise Operation Vanguard on uh, the legal component. Uh, we've already learned quite a lot from him. Uh, very surprising detail. But there is more. So, Professor Primpom Wating's report is out. Everybody is responding, reacting. But the simple question remains, why? Why did the fight against Galamsey fail? We're looking at an aspect of it, the operational aspect of it. What they did on the ground, Operation vanguard our guest is the man who was brought in by the military to advise them on the legal component of operation vanguard bear in mind he was brought in a year after the operation started and he came to meet several uh, inefficiencies and he sought to correct them but in that process he learned a lot about the reason why today we are describing it all as a failure ex-captain jamal tunzwa sedu is our guest and he's telling us a lot winston yeah so um captain you see if we had done a few things well we wouldn't have uh, there, would, there would be no need to continue 
because then it would deter a lot from getting involved. So let's let a thing or two. Why didn't you secure the prosecutions, the convictions that you wanted? What was wrong with the prosecution? Um, yeah, right, so think of it uh, if um, the mandate of the military, well, let's even go it this way. The troops were, the matter was secretized, and the troops were supposed to literally get these people, the illegal miners, out of the field. Sure. That was, that was the mandate. Yeah, that was your mandate. Of yes. the troops. Now, even as a lawyer and in the military, I have no power to prosecute. Now, those who were prosecuting these cases were mostly inspectors. Now, they have no, you know, formal training in law. They are not uh, technical people in that sense. They may have some familiarity with the criminal procedure, but the substantive law, um, they would obviously have limitations in that regard. So, for instance, one thing that I observed in my very first few days was that even the charges that were leveled against uh, suspected illegal miners were defective mm. because the Minerals and Mining Act, um, I think Section 99 or so, was amended by a subsequent legislation. Sure. And so you would even find a charge which would not say Section 99, for example, as amended. And so on a technicality, that could even be shot. That, that would not be, um, you know, a, a, a good charge. Are you were now, there, so? Yeah, but I'm talking of things that I observed mm -hmm. prior to uh, going in there. So okay. one thing that I did was after every operation, I would follow through, um, go to the police station, and then you know want to see the statements and and um, the charge the charge sheets, and to help the police draft these charges. Now another curious thing was that. I wonder what orientation people were given and whether there was um, someone thought that there was a need to build capacity in that regard because, like I said, there are obvious limitations of um, mm. some of the police elements in respect of the substantive criminal law. And so if you are combating my uh, illegal mining, you want to think a bit broadly. You want to think beyond just... Um, Infringe, beyond infringements of the Minerals and Mining Act. And, you know, you want to think about violations of um, our forestry laws, violations of um, our water laws. You want to think about even violation of our immigration laws. Mm. Like I told you, most of the elements who were involved in um, these operations were foreign nationals. So, I mean, you would want to, you know, really think creatively about whether there were violations of our immigration laws in terms of do the, did these people have entry or stay permits? Did they have work permits and so on? And so, you know, in order to really get the law bite and be effective, you want to think about, you know, drafting as many charges as possible. So you go to a site, you find um, a suspected illegal mining operation. Mm. Um, you, 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 you're thinking of charges along the lines of violations of our minerals, uh, mineral laws, charges along the lines of um, our water laws because um, you know, floating platforms are mounted on riverbeds. You want to think about the timber that has been cleared um, for mm. the earth to be dug and um, you know the earth that held the timber resources. So did you have any t timber rights, for example? And so did you, if you say you were a cook in the field, most of the foreign nationals who were mm. caught would, would allege they were just engineers who had come to se uh, service uh, mining equipment or they are cooks who were cooking for some foreigners. But you want to ask basic questions like, how did you come into Ghana? Mm -hmm. um, is your stay regularized? Mm -hmm. um, um, do you have a work permit to work as an engineer in Ghana mm -hmm. or a cook? But you would find charges just, oh, ABC um, was engaged in, you know, illegal mining contrary to Section X of the Mineral Mining Act. Mm. And uh, which section would even be a good section because it has been repealed. So you mm. must actually refer to the precise, mm. um, you know, or, or, or the, re the, the, the revised kind of um, provision. I so see. I detected these, and I was helping the police to draft um, some of 
these charges. But that was beyond my mandate or our mandate, mm. um, in all honesty. But that was a national cause, and we all needed to go the extra mile. So listening to you, 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 you're telling us that we needed more competent people to prosecute these persons. Did you make this recommendation since you were helping? Did you actually inform the committee, the attorney general, on what was going on? Yes, I did. But remember, we are in a reg or I was in a regimented institution. Mm. This was a young captain in his um, first year in the rank, mm. um, uh, you know, working as a staff officer, reporting ultimately to a colonel, mm. um, and and and. Um, the kennel, there was no way to bypass the kennel and uh, report to even my department or even um, the the you know the headquarters at, at Bema Camp, mm. and so I wrote two memos. I um, I think one of them had to do with um, an analysis that said that look, even though the police have the power to prosecute, but they have limitations. So I wouldn't use the word incompetent. I mean, it's just they've not had that training mm -hmm. in the substantive criminal law. And um, we understand these things, and we are very serious people. The military is a very serious institution. I must commend um, the military for its work there, but it, it also had its own limitations. But it had to do with how institutions collaborated mm -hmm. on that occasion. And so, so um, my advice was that we can prosecute these offenses. In fact, we should not be thinking about boots in the field. We should be thinking about emphasizing and enhancing the criminal justice aspect of it. Like I told you earlier on, enough uh, or substantial arrests were made, substantial mm -hmm. confiscations were made. There are exhibits. Uh, we have courts. Mm -hmm. And so let us prosecute these, and that would have a deterrent effect. How, and, lo how long did you serve in this role? Um, a little below six months, okay. I think, um, at least four months. Okay. I think I had two tours. So during your time there, you obviously reported everything up the chain to the colonel, your commanding officer. Did you feel that any of your recommendations were ad adopted? Some were adopted. So there were two main recommendations. One of them was that I instituted a standard operating procedure which said that, look, um, once you go on operations, the platoon commander comes back, the platoon commander should complete a certain form. And it was just to strengthen the evidence. Mm. I, I didn't want the lapse of, ta of time mm. to make people doubt what they saw in there. So you come back, you report, and uh, you account for all that you had seen there. Mm. Interestingly, we had elements from, the at the time, the Directorate of Public Relations who would video and take photoshots of all that took place during the operation. Mm. And that was good evidence. Mm. And in addition to that, um, I needed, you know, these uh, platoon commanders who had gone with the troops to also, you know, you know put something in writing. Mm. And then that would form a basis for me to do follow-ups at the police, um, you know, stations and, and so on and so forth. And also to, to take stock and inventory of mm. the confiscated items. But the mm. second one, so the standard operating procedures were adopted, but right. that was just almost before, uh, that was actually immediately after I I, I I made the recommendation. But the second mm. one, which I think was also crucial and would have helped so much, had to do with the request for a fiat mm -hmm. from um, the Attorney General's Department to permit whosoever was advising as legal officer or to empower that person to prosecute. Right. I mean, we are trained in the law. Uh, it's our own classmates who are at the mm -hmm. Attorney General's Department and who are prosecuting. And, uh, but, I mean, as, as a military lawyer, you cannot prosecute. Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost like saying you have no agency in court. Right. You go to court and you have no audience. Mm -hmm. uh, the basic things like you see a frivolous application for the release of an excavator and you have the evidence to uh, draft an affidavit in opposition to that application mm. and you want to submit that and argue in court that this is unmeritorious but you cannot do it because the law just says you cannot prosecute mm. and we're not saying make military lawyers prosecutors we're just saying 
military advisors to the joint operation who mm -hmm. are lawyers mm -hmm. at least make that person empower that person to prosecute and by our laws you just need a fiat did you uh, apply for this fiat directly or again did you send it up the the the, food the, chain? the command chain yes mm -hmm. I, I sent it through the mm. chain of command i remember i was invited to um the general headquarters at the time mm. um the the chief of staff was back for he invited he himself was a lawyer mm -hmm. um so from Obuasi, i was invited by uh, the director general of um, the joint operations at the time he was one brigadier poku mm -hmm. he invited me uh because of my memo and i appeared before him he matched me to the chief of staff and we had a 10 minute conversation and then he told me that based on the insights that i had provided and um, the importance of what i had requested for he would add me to a delegation that would be visiting the interministerial committee on illegal mining but um, that never happened i honestly don't know what happened in between then and, and now but i was hoping that we could get a fiat mm -hmm. and like i'm saying um if we were really serious about you know combating illegal mining at the time that we instituted operation vanguard we didn't even need boots in the field we didn't need any further arrest and um, seizures and confis uh, and, and and impound the impounding of equipment all we needed to do was to consolidate the gains that we had made by way of arrests and the seizures and so in terms of um how that policy was formulated mm -hmm. i would say that who what by what metrics were we going to evaluate the outcomes mm -hmm. because it's not just a set of activities right i'm thinking that if it's coming from that high office it's going to be okay right so we have certain activities that we think would bring about certain outcomes mm. in the intermediate term we would um, evaluate those outcomes and mm. see whether they will point towards the final outcomes mm. and so what what metrics were the policy uh, makers mm. relying upon for us to succeed in this fight That's was it just arrest was it just seizures and I think that would have been wrong. That's a very interesting question, bearing in mind that the Minister for Monitoring and Evaluation was a member of the Interministerial Committee at the time. Um, if you just joined us, we're talking to ex-Captain Jamal Tunzwa Seydou. He was legal advisor to Operation Vanguard, brought in a year after the operation started to set up the legal component for this operation, the legal backing for this operation. We're learning a lot from him. So, Captain, um how do you come by the conclusion that we didn't need a lot more boots in the field and we could have just consolidated the gains? How do you come by that conclusion? Well, like I said to you, you just want to think about it in terms of cost effectiveness. Like, uh, So the final outcomes that we needed was to um, bring the situation of illegal mining and the environmental devastation that accompanied it to the barest minimum. That was the final outcome that we needed. Sure. And so with limited resources, how can you achieve this end? So think about the procurement of land cruiser uh, troopers. Think about, you know, allowances for boots in the field. Think about, um, um, you know, ration for, for these people. Think about uniforms. Think about even other, you know, aspects of national life that we could deploy these troops to and if you could do away with that but rather use or consolidate the gains that you had made within one year to achieve the final outcome in terms of cost effectiveness i think that would have been cost effective so 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 that, that's, that's what my question is those gains how are we going to consolidate them in what ways are we going to consolidate them because these are people who even during a ban were still on the field mining and so how were we going to do that? I mean, if the arrests were not deterring enough, how else were we going to do that? <laughs> well, so these are matters in the public domain. Mm -hmm. You would remember the issues relating to the Upper Paramount Forest and the, um, the, the Cobra, Cobra Forest. forest. Yes. Um, the arrests... And that's why I asked about what metrics were we working with. The arrests mean nothing. If you arrest 
say, 10 foreign nationals who were operating with, say, about seven excavators in broad daylight, captured on video with pictures and all that, and with troops who had first-hand knowledge of this and can testify in court. And within a day or two, uh, you would find that bail is granted to bail, bail you know bail applications are made and these people are released and um you know excavators are the exhibits okay. have been moved uh, what 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 do arrests and seizures really mean okay. um so these same people will get back into the field so it is if the law was biting that mm. because you are mining you've lost seven excavators mm. and because you are a foreign national and you are mining you're going to jail for 15 years, maybe. Yeah. Um, you know, and you're saying there was only one judge presiding over these cases. Yes, um, Justice Naura is now at the court of uh, the, the high court. He did you? Did you? I mean, and, and in the Papama forest that you talk about, for instance, in one of the videos, you saw some, uh, you know, persons who. I mean, you saw some persons in military with military uniform also in the, one of those videos. Did you, at any point in time, meet military persons protecting people mining? in these forest reserves well they were captured on video so i said did you i mean in, did any of these come to your attention while you were there with the Cobo forest yes by the time so you you can you you, you would have an operation that would be mounted say at dawn and um by the time all the you know, suspected illegal miners uh, you know, put bundled together, and um, the excavators are pulled out. You would you would find your colleagues in uniform who would appear, and you would wonder how they appeared there. But um, what did they tell you when when they appear? Well, um, <laughs> let's Listen. let's let's no. Um, I'm, I I do not want in this conversation to go beyond what is in the public domain, right? Mm. So um, I'll just leave it at that, mm. you know. Um, but, you know, the public is interested in some of these things. I mean, they ask these questions because, you know, sometimes when... So, and, and that's why we're asking you. So I think you want to fill in the gaps with what Professor Frimpon Boatin has put out there or what the report mm. or alleged report has put out there that um, you could you can plug in the, the holes but okay maybe let's do I, it this um, way because you were a legal advisor yes so you've uh, uh, based on the legal framework that you have established or set up for this operation they go out to seize equipment of those who are mining legally then military men and women protecting those who are mining illegally turn up how does that get resolved in that example that you have how did it get resolved well i was just a staff officer mm -hmm. um Praman, for instance it's one of those i mean it's in the public domain i'm mm -hmm. not talking about it so you'd find a signed post of the Forestry Commission saying Apapama Forest reclamation. Mm. Um, yet intelligence would get to um, the troops and the troops would mount an operation, go to this alleged um, reclamation mm. site, you know, meet some state officials uh, of the security services providing protection, layers of them eventually get in there, and then indeed illegal mining has taken place. Mm. Um, Joy FM has captured some of these things on video. Mm. How they were resolved, I can't pretend to know, because um, you know I'm just at the tactical stage, mm. at the operational and the strategic level, and all that is in between that mm. and what goes on, yeah. I, was I'm never, I was never privy mm. to any of them. I do understand your situation because uh, for some details that were not in the public domain, you have to remember that you were legal, legal counsel, if you will, to the operation. And so I understand your, your limitations there. Look, let's wrap up with this, okay, because our time is almost up. But this is the key thing. You've, you've explained why it didn't work, why there perhaps wasn't any need for an entire military boots on the ground operation. You've also talked about how prosecution is where the focus should have been in order to make meaning 
of all the arrests. Today, looking at what we have in Professor Primpombwating's report, does it seem to you that the failure to do what was obviously the right thing was deliberate? It does. Point is, like I keep saying, and I'm now wearing my policy hat. If you have a situation and you think that how to resolve it would be to securitize the situation, you want to ask yourself what has been the history of this and what has been the history of securitization. There was Operation Halt 1 and Operation Halt 2 which were to combat illegal logging and to combat illegal mining. So one very simple way of thinking about Operation Vanguard was that it was a scale-up of Operation Halt 2. But you want to ask yourself, what lessons from Operation Halt 2 would inform a scaling up of that? Um, and how would you want to modify it to fit the current situation that you have? And so for me, coming from such a high office like the presidency, where I want to believe that serious and competent people are working and advising, I want to see someone ask questions like, what inputs do we need? What outputs do we need? What activities do we need to see? What would be our intermediate outcomes? And what will be our final outcomes? And in terms of the lesson learned, uh, if we even use the same kind of mechanism for Operation Hall 2, we would understand how, which mechanism led to which outcomes mm -hmm. and then think about how to uh, modify it appropriately. So the mere fact that we had lessons from Operation Halt 2 to learn and to inform us as to whether it was justifiable to scale up a security operation, mm. um, it's something that my mind cannot explain to me how come we are just, um, you know, gone to the extent of a joint operation. So you feel it was it, it, it was deliberately set up to fail? It, I would say so. And and one thing, there was two other things. One had to do with tough wars that I don't understand why the Attorney General's department would not give a fiat to another government lawyer who is willing and capable and available and motivated to prosecute well, uh, such offenses. You have to first then know whether or not again, the, the request got to the Attorney General's uh, Oh, It did, it did. Okay. My officials told me it did. But okay. th I mean, they told me we would never get it. That was not the I first see. time we, um, they had yeah. made such an application. Okay. Um, and finally, the other point. Well, you, you just made me lose my time. I'm so um, sorry. You said that there were yeah. two things. Uh, first of all, you don't understand why the fiat was not granted. Yes, and secondly... Um, if you looked at the entire setup, you would want to see some effective collaboration between institutions like mm -hmm. um, the, the uh, Forestry Commission, the Minerals Commission, mm -hmm. the Water Resources Commission, mm -hmm. the police service, the military. Mm -hmm. You want to see capacity being built. You want to know, I mean, who has what role mm -hmm. um, so that the whole team effort would be effective. But mm -hmm. that was obviously missing. And mm -hmm. Professor Fimpom Watins, um, report uh, actually said that mm. even some members of the interministerial commission mm. uh, committee on illegal mining mm. were well, um, you know they were not really proactive if not they were even missing in the whole effort Indeed. and so um collaboration inter inter institutional collaborations and then the spelling out of rules right. and making sure that um there will be synergies that was missing and so okay. I mean, it's common sense that these things would be needed for us to have the kind of outcomes that we needed. All right. I want to say a big thank you to you. I wish we had more time. Ex-Captain Jamal Tunzwa Sedu uh, was uh, legal advisor to Operation Vanguard. Uh, he's uh, given us a peek behind the curtain to understand how things were working, or more accurately, not working on that operation, for which reason today we have a failed fight against Galamsee.